Assalamu alaikum and hello everyone. I'm your host, Hannah Zuberi, and welcome back to another episode of Justice for All Now on Muslim Network TV. You can watch us on Galaxy 19, Roku TV, Amazon Fire, and soon on Apple TV. Discrimination and irrational fear of Muslims and Islam is still on the rise across the nation, even amongst COVID-19, COVID as well as the, the nation going through a deep crisis over police violence. So according um, to a report published by the Institute of so uh, Social Policy and Understanding, net negative public opinion has increased over the last two years. Nationally, Muslims only account for, uh, officially, for 1% of the population, yet Islam is also the fastest growing religion in the United States. Recently, we saw a small town in Tennessee be the center of um, extreme Islamophobia. An article was, um, uh, an ad was published in the Tennessean newspaper, a local newspaper in Nashville, Tennessee, that suggested that Muslims are prepared to use nuclear weapons against the United States, potentially inciting more hatred and fear towards the American Muslim population. The Tennessean is run by editor Maria de Verine, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, um, and is the principal daily newspaper in Nashville, Tennessee. Joining us today, so there was a response, obviously, on social media, nationally, national organizations got involved, but we wanted to hear the voice of local uh, local uh, Muslim community members from uh, Tennessee, from Nashville, especially, and especially the leadership from that area, because they know their community like no one else does. So joining us today to discuss the recent incident and the aftermath, and some positive, some negative, um, is Sabina Muyuddin. She's the former director of the local, um, she is actually, Sabina Muyuddin is a Bangladeshi American Muslim, born and raised in Nashville, Tennessee. She graduated from the Vanderbilt University in 1993 with a degree in mechanical engineering. So in 2010, Sabina helped launch the Daughters and Sons and Daughters of Abraham Project, which brings Muslims, Christians, and Jewish youth across Middle Tennessee together for interfaith dialogue and outreach programs. She's also a founding board member and currently the executive director of the American Muslim Advisory Council, which empowers the Muslim community in Tennessee through civic engagement, community building, and improved media relations. So thank you so much, Sabina, for being here. Thank you. Assalamualaikum. Aikam as salam. So let's um, tell us more about Nashville, Tennessee. What, you know, how big is it? What, uh, how big is the Muslim population there? Uh, how many masajid do you guys have? So uh, the Middle Tennessee uh, area has uh, about a million um, residents, and in um, Nashville is the largest, second largest city mm -hmm. in, in Tennessee, and the capital. And in the Middle Tennessee area, we have about forty thousand. Muslims, and so our largest uh, community in in uh, Nashville is the Kurdish community, um, comprising about uh, fifteen to twenty thousand uh, strong. And then we have a, a large population from the Somali community, and then and then you have all you know from around the world, and then we have African American uh, communities. So in this area, we have eleven. Uh, mosque is in Middle Tennessee, but um, so you know we we're, we're a vibrant community in the middle of the Bible Belt. Mm. And tell so what does that mean to be a vibrant community in the middle of the Bible Belt? What does that look like? Um, how active is the community? So the American Muslim Advisory Council we're a statewide organization. So we, we work across the state, but obviously in the larger cities. Um, they're usually more progressive, um, usually, you know, in terms of Islamophobia, you know, it's, it's a bit less than if you go into rural Tennessee. And for myself, uh, I used to live in Tullahoma, Tennessee, a little town, say over 95% white, um, very 
conservative Christian community. And so, you know, what you see in rural Tennessee will be vastly different what you, than what you see um, in Nashville. But those elements of, um, uh, you know, those who uh, try to marginalize our community and um, do the fear mongering, uh, they're, they're everywhere. So I wanted to see, ask you, what, how many incidents of um, anti-Muslim bigotry has taken place in that area um, in the recent years? In the recent years, I mean, so you, you really have to think about in terms of bullying in school and, and, and uh, threats to our mosque. We, we've had some threats. Uh, to some of our mosques, uh, bullying in school is, is something you always hear. I don't, you know, it uh, it's always present. And and as you know, especially when, with the, the 2016 election, um, there was a lot of fear in the community. And you know, this our kids. Uh, unfortunately, they're almost like on the front lines in terms of um, when something bad is going on in the community, they feel it first. Uh, we hear cases of discrimination uh, all the time and um, you know and, and you know companies that tolerate it and so th these things are always alive and present he, um, when this happened when the ad came out um, was this something that you would have expected in the newspaper tell us more about the newspaper and what actually for for our audience the ad came out it was a full page ad in the local newspaper and uh, extremely inflammatory criminal i would call it criminal um the uh, the accusations and it was you know it was by a nonprofit i believe uh, or a faith based organization that had put this faith-based organization. So tell us more about, uh, have you, had you seen it? What was your reaction? Did you see it online first or did you open up the newspaper and see it? Well, you know, nowadays we don't get paper copies of the okay. newspaper. So, um, you know, actually I woke up and it was already being posted mm -hmm. um, online. And so that's, that's where I first saw it. Uh, it was a feeling of shock. Mm -hmm. it was a shock. Now, the details of what was in the ad, you know, it was literally, you know, saying that July 18th, uh, Islam is going to Islam. get a nuclear bomb in Nashville. So it was very, it was um, uh, very specific um, to Nashville. And uh, so I was shocked to see it in the Tennessean. So over the years, I would say like uh, in 2010, there was an article in the Tennessean um, and it was called, is, is Islam a threat? And, and the whole premise of the article was problematic. And we, as community leaders, Muslim community leaders, we, we reacted right away. We organized, we talked to the, um, the newspaper editors and, and said, you know, how could you print this? And we explained uh, on so many levels uh, what was wrong with it. And so, and from that point, we started to build a better relationship with them. And so over the years, I, you know, publishing different, um, uh, different, uh, editorials and and then articles and being able to have that relationship when something's going on in our community to be able to amplify it um, and not not have the media always be reactionary so if it's something happened overseas then they're like oh what is a Muslim community reaction but really like what are what are our roots in the community and how are we part of this community and so we we have really we have really good relationships with a number of editors and reporters and so seeing this in the Tennessee was a shock it was just literally a shock and um, with um, and you know for me having lived in rural Tennessee, um groups like this these um end of time groups with mm -hmm. all these absurd prophecies that are going to happen this is not some not something new like in my small town i lived in you would see 
once in a while ads in the newspaper that a church was bringing this group in to talk about end of times. So what uh, was being said wasn't so shocking to me because I know it's out there, but the fact that uh, a reputable newspaper in the second largest city in Tennessee would print it was shocking. Now we reached out to the editors and reporters and, um, and I, you know, of course, they were apologetic. They were shocked themselves. They didn't know that, you know, the ad ran. Uh, and so, so can you explain that? So the editorial uh, department is totally separate. And it hasn't uh, the Tennessean been brought, bought out by a larger, uh, by, by the USA Today? From Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, and, and that, that is true. The editorial department is separate from the marketing and uh, and from the advertising uh, department. Um, so, but regardless, the final product is on their shoulders. shoulders yeah. uh, and they, and uh, they took responsibility uh, for it. But it's, the problem is, is the damage cannot be undone. Mm. And, and so uh, how can you go back um, from, from that? And, you know, because, you know, even though they pulled the ad from the online um, edition, people had the paper edition at home. Mm -hmm. and so you never know, you know, who is out there who reads it and says, well, this just, you know, uh, you know, verifies all, all, all the ideas I had about Muslims and Islam. And, and so, it had uh, the Pope's picture on it. Yes. Right? And it looks like, an, uh, it doesn't even look like an ad. It looks like an article, the way it's laid out. Right. Right. It could, be, it could have been an editorial from the paper and, and, and exactly. unless you were really paying attention. And and I made the point that, you know, I know I can write an editorial, put it as an ad and pay money and have it printed by mm -hmm. a newspaper. I mean, this is what was being done, right? Mm -hmm. And so what what are their um what are their protocols mm. for for getting an an ad published? So you know, is this anyone can do? You know, put something like that. And and this ad came out on Sunday, and a few days before, the same group had another ad, which looks similar, but the writings was a little different. But it was kind of a build up to Sunday's ad, so it didn't talk about Islam uh, or Muslims directly. Um, but I think. It should have been caught at that moment okay. that this is a problematic ad, and I, and I think that's where you know, and we you know demanded uh, the Tennessean that you need better education, um, cultural competency, but education about Islamophobia, mm -hmm. so you can see and recognize you know that they should have been able to recognize from that first ad where this was leading up to, to, and it was leading up to something no good, and. Uh you, your, or um, your city has had its first councilwoman, who is a uh, African Muslim, African American Muslim, um, and uh, so this is uh, just having look. So, so you, that's progress on that front, mm -hmm. but that also scares people. It scares people to see someone like that representing, you know, um, you know, the chain. So, so what's the reaction to her election. So uh, Zulfat Swera, she's. Uh, a Nigerian uh, immigrant, and she became a councilwoman at large. So she represents all of Nashville and all of Nashvilleians. So, uh, I mean, it, she's been um, a strong voice for all marginalized communities uh, here in Nashville, and, um, and her expertise in finance has helped her through the you know, very difficult budget pro pro uh, process. So, you know, people know her, and mm -hmm. Yes, you know, you know, somebody asked me like, uh, do you, you know, with all the progress made in Nashville, you know, how, how, you know, what does this mean? Like, and I say, you know, the more progress you make, the more the people who are against you will shout louder. Okay. And, and so it's still to be expected. It's to be expected. So, you know, we're not surprised, you know, as an organization, AMAC was founded in 2012. And um, in 2010, um, all the controversy over the building of the Murfreesboro Mosque. Mm -hmm. and, and they went through 
they went through hell in terms of, you know, the pushback they got in the community and the discrimination and bullying of the kids. So, you know, and then 2011, um, there was an anti-Sharia bill in the Tennessee State Legislature. So the Tennessee State Legislature has been testing ground for a lot of extreme bills. And uh, we organized this Muslim community and we brought our allies and we pushed back and we realized that, you know, our, uh, our mosque weren't equipped to fight Islamophobia, that you mm -hmm. need an organization. And that's how we started uh, the American Muslim Advisory Council. So, you know, through the years, we... we yeah, you guys brought over Paul Galloway, Issa Galloway. Yeah. Uh, yes. yes. Run it. yeah. He was the executive director uh, for a few years. And, um, and so, you know, there's always something going on, always something we have to react to. And I think, uh, and I, I'm, I'm glad uh, you, um, you know, reach out to us to interview because we're the ones working on the ground mm -hmm. uh, on these issues. We know our community. What works in New York or Chicago or Washington, D.C. does not necessarily work in Tennessee. That's we that I wanted to ask you, should small cities and uh, people watching this who might be living uh, in small cities across the United States or Canada, wherever they may be, who are facing anti-Muslim bigotry. And remember, like we, we're beaming out to places where you might not have a large Muslim community. So should smaller cities uh, with smaller cities, I don't mean like the size of the actual city, but the smaller uh, American Muslim population is a small, a smaller in their area. Uh, should they use the same tactics as cities with large populations of Muslims? Uh, no, I, I think you, you have to be, uh, you have to know your people and you have to know, know who your enemies are. You have to know who, who are those, you know, who are just being misled mm -hmm. and, and you have to work with your allies mm -hmm. and you have to work with your allies on the ground. When um, outside organizations come in and they try to take over, or take the lead, uh, they have no credibility in the community. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so, and that sometimes causes uh, a larger backlash. And, and so, you know, in part of our strategy is always, sometimes we will publicly um, talk about an issue. So in the 2018 gubernatorial campaign, uh, our, uh, the candidate, um, uh, uh, Bill Leaves made a comment uh, that was disparaging against his uh, opponent because he was visiting a Muslim restaurant. Mm -hmm. and, and we called him out on it. We called him out. That was something we publicly called him out and they called me and apologized. And that was important. But then some there were other incidents. There was um, going to be a security summit. Mm -hmm. So instead of calling them out uh, publicly, which may have caused more backlash, which may have caused more of the Islamophobic or people who supported that security summit to come out mm -hmm. um, and and uh, uh, raise their voices. We decided let's take get our allies, let's get um, to reach out and put the pressure on the president of the university where this event was going to happen. So, you know, we know the community, we know which uh, which avenues to go through, which allies to um, pull up and, and ask, but, you know, know that we're, we're taking the lead in terms of doing it. But, you know, strategy calls for sometimes doing things in a very public facing manner and sometimes doing things behind the scene. Whatever works for our community, that's what we're what, when, do, when does national or international pressure help? And when does it hurt? I, I think, um, you know, it, it, it can hurt in terms of um, outside, uh, in terms of pre putting pressure um, on, on the government. But, you know, Tennessee legislature is, very conservative mm -hmm. and so and, and that's sometimes the problems we have um and and sometimes they see national organizations stepping in as a, almost um like a, a badge of courage or you know like mm -hmm. you know a victory for them and they can actually raise more money for their causes mm -hmm. because the national organization said this is, this is about them and so um you know i, I think can it, can it out, help at sometimes can huh? it help can it help um can national and international pressure help 
because even oh, yeah. a tweet was going I, I, on. I think it can help, but they have to work with the people on the ground. Oh, exactly. Yeah. So. And, and, and so the strategy has to be, um, you know, worked out together. Mm, that's that's true. Um, so this is something that and 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 this is something that I, be, I was watching on social media and following. And I can see where there's a lot of like people are calling for the, you know, the, the entire newspaper to go, you know, be just shut down. Uh, some people were calling for, um, you know, civ, you know, the, the USA Today to to fire the top editorial staff, all sorts of things that we were seeing on social media. But uh, things have like what has transpired since then? And what were your asks and how many of those have been met? So some of these things are all we're still working on. OK, so, so some of these things are still working on, but they have publicly. Uh, I mean, through the article and through uh, calls, they have apologized. They were embarrassed mm -hmm. by what happened. Um, there was a, um, uh, a sales manager who was fired, but we want to know more details because it's, it cannot be on the shoulders of one person. Mm -hmm. So definitely we are asking for more. We were asking for a better protocol in terms of what is approved and uh, not approved for uh, advertising. Uh, and then uh, we, we are uh, asking that uh, they have diversity training and a training on Islamophobia. So when they when they're running stories, they understand. You know, they we you know we we've seen it over and over again. Uh, so many uh, media uh, groups and media stories that. Um, you know, they they marginalize the Muslim community. They only talk about us in terms of threats, whether we're safe or we're a threat, you know? Uh, and, and so educating them on that, but also really, I, I mean, um, wanting diversity in staff. Mm -hmm. So there is not a, a Muslim working in, in their staff and, and, and you have to look at the reporters and staff and the stakeholders in the newspaper. Um, are there any Muslims there? I mean, I mean, not just Muslims, diversity in general. Uh, if you're a media outlet, you need to have all perspectives on board. And it's great that, you know, they call us or, uh, you know, sometimes we're writing editorials um, or their articles in, about our community. But it has to come from within, mm -hmm. so it has to be uh, from from their their staff. So, would you um, want a ten the Tennessean to uh, be shut down tomorrow? We have a relationship with them. They are the largest newspaper, the mostly white, most widely read newspaper. Is mm -hmm. that in our best interest to have them shut down? Mm -hmm. You know, like, we, you know, we get our stories out, too. This is, uh, you know, we have to be strategic. And, um, local, and their local newspapers are shutting down all across the country. And right. that, that's not good for a democracy. No. So, so that, that you know, as personally from my end, I, that I would hate to see a paper shut down, um, especially if their editorial staff is not blatantly Islamophobic. But we cannot deny that. Look at this, um, the, the ad, right? This, the, the ad itself, it was uh, Islamophobically charged. The advertisement was full page. So not only, uh, and, and, and the, the claims were just so bizarre, bizarre. Uh, that, that, but this message is not only harmful to Nashville's community, not just to Tennessee, but the country as a whole. Uh, we are in an election year. So how do you think this kind of rhetoric uh, could influence President Trump's campaign in the coming year? Um, do you think this kind of... Um, sentiment could harm the direction that your city is uh, going in? So with or without this article, it's an election year. Mm -hmm. And you should, you know, and ISPU, um, you know, they, they, ha they have their data that shows that um, uh, Islamophobic attacks rise during election years. Mm -hmm. And so even before this ad came out, I was warning community members Look, this is an election year. Be on the lookout, hmm. and um, you know, and 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 this was an ad. But politicians are going to say what they need, um, and to label us a threat and, and bring up the national security issue. Um, we already know Trump, Trump's track record. You know, he's going to say whatever he's 
he's going to say against our community. So uh, I'm more worried about uh, the local elections, you know, the state houses and state senate, and how uh, they um, draw draw on this issue and how they use it. Because a lot of oftentimes it's the rural counties that's mm-hmm. where it's happening. That's where. There are hardly any Muslims living. Um, how, you know, where are they going to get the pushback? And and that's the work that we do. You know, building these relationships with different groups uh, to say, look, we're empowering you. When you see some, you know, see something hateful uh, against our community, speak up. Uh, you know, say you're not going to tolerate it. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so uh, you know making those uh, connections and building those uh, friendships and alliances uh, are very important, but just expect it. It's an election year. So that's, I mean, so that's the messaging that a lot of people who might be in similar situations across the country expect it, be diligent about pushing back. Don't take, you know, so from what I'm hearing from you is don't take it lying down, uh, Mm -hmm up whether publicly or privately and address that hate so one of the things that um when uh you were, were looking at uh just even this ad um and uh you know where you know the whole thing about warfare and islam and so what has a, um the community in nashville and the fact that you all are uh next to, uh, like the nexus of where Act for America, which mm-hmm. is the largest anti-Muslim um, grassroots organizations in the country who have been behind these Sharia law, anti-Sharia laws and just extreme hate towards Muslims. Um, you're in that, uh, that's where you guys are located. So um, yeah, I, I would love for to uh, to hear what are your plans um, and what, what have you all been doing to educate people, um, get people involved in um, and getting more of the Muslim community civically engaged? So uh, so our, our mission is to empower the Muslim community. And, and, that takes, and, that, and that comes in different ways. So first of all, we all know we have to be civically engaged. Mm-hmm. We, you know, we, we need to be out there in the community. We need to know what the issues are, um, especially with the local elections, um, and, and, and need to be voting, you mm-hmm. know? And, and not all our community members or citizens, they can all vote, but those who can need to be voting. And if you can't, you can still be, uh, uh, you know, working, be civically engaged and working on issues. Uh, I think, what, you know, educating our community on these issues is important. Um, and right now with uh, Black Lives Matter protests, uh, that is one of the, um, you know, one of uh, the areas we're working on, um, not just, you know, educating our community on a, uh, racism and anti-blackness within the community, but trying to understand racism with the, within the educational, uh, uh, with education, within and the economic inequities in the community. So, so, you know, not just telling people to vote, but empowering them with, you know, uh, understanding the issues. Um, and then we, work on educating the community. So whether that's educating the Muslim community in terms of the rights Mm -hmm. uh, with law enforcement in the workplace, but also educating the non-Muslim community about uh, who we are as a Muslim, as Muslims. But what I, you know, what I think is really key um, and we can do a lot of Islam one-on-one and that's a great starting point, Mm -hmm. uh, but we need to educate people about Islamophobia. Hmm. People don't understand it. And so, yeah, they don't understand that it's a multi billion dollar industry, not just millions, billions. Right. Uh, and, and people are funded. That's what they exactly. run their careers on. So, definitely, that is something that our, you know, pe- even our own communities don't understand. Exactly. And there's a lot of internalized Islamophobia in, in our own communities. Right. So uh, good Muslim, bad Muslim kind of um, dynamics. Exactly. Uh, who's acceptable? Who's not acceptable? Uh, that 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 is an important conversation to have, like within the Muslim community and then outside the Muslim community. So cultural competency training and training around Islamophobia, and, and then it, it is you know part of empowering the community is is our relationship with media. It, it is getting our stories 
in, in uh, whether it's in print or broadcast or through social media, getting our stories out there. So we control the narrative. We have to control the narrative. Mm -hmm. So um, as we have a, a few minutes left, I know you have um, a meeting to follow up with all, all of that. So as you go, let us know what has transpired since then. So the sales manager has been fired. Mm -hmm. um, they have decided, the newspaper has decided to grant um, a gift to your organization mm -hmm. of all the ad money that yeah. came from those ads. What else has happened? Uh, they, they've also, um, they've also, uh, are giving us uh, $25,000 in free ad space okay. to use as we wish. And they're also granting $25,000 for Muslim organizations and businesses to have that free ad space. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, th that is something we want to use strate strategically, use it wisely um, to uh, really benefit the community and not just the Muslim community, the broader community, because mm -hmm. really, you know, um, in saying, you know, empowering our community means we build alliances w that we're not just fighting for our own rights, but as Muslims, we fight for everyone's rights. We fight for justice. So uh, I think that's an important, um, you know, focus. That's a focus we have to keep to. That, that we really we want to stand up for justice for all. That's great. Thank you so much for being with us and. Um, sharing your thoughts, um, I, you know, we're, we're following this as a case study uh, mm -hmm. just to see what happens when, because it's it's hard enough to fight Islamophobia uh, in in larger metropolitan areas where there is a, you know, there are more allies yeah. but to fight it at, at on the ground in small, uh, you know, smaller community Muslim communities, and just just see the powerful work that is coming. That's important to highlight, and it's important for people to learn from that, um, because not everything is about like. And a lot of times, for people who are working nationally, including ourselves internationally, you know, sometimes it's like sort of like you come, you you focus on a case and then you move on because because there's so many more happening across the net, uh, across this uh, town. So it's sort of like hit and run and move on. But but you guys are the ones who have to deal with the aftermath and exactly. you know, building those bonds. And it's your children on the front lines. It's your brothers and sisters on the front lines in that city. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, so uh, one thing that I would say, like, yes, what you said is, work together, strategize together, and take the locals, take the lead. So um, this is, that's, um, you know, thank you so much for being oh, here with God. us today, Sabrina, and good luck and keep us updated. And maybe we'll, you know, uh, do this and would love to have Councilwoman Zulfat on here once she's less busy and the budget passes. <laughs>
And what was the reaction of your community just locally? So I'm not talking about their, um, the organizations, obviously there, that's their, um, mo you know, there's their, that's their job to respond to events like this, but as a community member, as somebody, a mother and a wife who lives in that, you know, as a doctor in that community, what was the reaction of the local community? The local community was shocked and saddened, as I've said earlier. What this ad does is that it plays into the stereotypes and it incites violence against a minority. Mm -hmm. Islamophobia and anti-Semitism are fangs of the same snake. Mm -hmm. Anti-Semitism gets condemned. Unfortunately, Islamophobia does not get condemned. This is one of the things that uh, we actually wrapped up a, a meeting with the Tennessean editorial board where they reached out to leaders in Muslim community to offer their sincere apologies and to reflect on this moment. And the consensus from the Muslim community was we were all on the same page. The first thing is that we needed to ask how a colossal mistake of that nature could happen at an institution like Tennessean. Mm. It is one of the oldest papers in Tennessee, as you know, it has huge readership. And we hold a uh, Tennessean to a high journalistic standard. Mm. We expect better from them and we, we expect them to make sure that this is a mistake that does not happen again. Mm. It, uh, it, it puts a target on the back of the Muslim community. Oh, definitely. Because uh, as we saw that the ad was extremely, it was criminal. Uh, that's something that I've uh, that that I feel like it's not only shameful, but that it could be um, used to uh, not only target the Muslim community, just the level of uh, hatred in it, the level of disinformation. So that was what was really shocking to those of us who don't live there. And so I do understand that um, the Muslim community has had an increasingly friendly uh, relationship with editorial staff and um, the edit, you know up to the newspaper. So this isn't something, and this is something that I noticed on uh, your Twitter uh, as well, is that you don't want the Tennessean to shut down. Uh, and tell us why, like especially the role of local journalism, why is that important to you? Well, it is important to me because uh, once you start taking, once you participate in the political uh, conversations, you understand that how journalists are an integral part of making sure that the stories are brought to light for, for the readers to, to read and know and understand. It was important for me to know and see that the reporters whose work I really value and appreciate and respect, when they saw this ad, they were appalled. Mm. A lot of them personally messaged me saying how embarrassed they felt that the organization that employs them had run this ad and, and it was a, you know, it was a le level of professional negligence that happened in the ads and marketing department. And not a lot of folks understand that the editorial department and the sales and marketing de department work independently of each other. A lot of these editors, a lot of these reporters have been on furlough off and on, taking one week off and then working for a week. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of them do not have access to the work tools to be able to respond to when this um, happened on Sunday, and they felt frustrated over it and I sensed it, I felt it. And in times where journalism is under attack, the journalism and journalists are under a constant threat, uh, we feel that it's important for people to understand that canceling subscription is not the right way to go. Yes, holding them responsible is important. Asking questions is important making sure that they put in place checks and balances so that a mistake like this never happens again is important. But axing journalism is not the answer. Uh, just like our African-American community and the entire country is right now going through this moment, which is bigger than any of us, the Black Lives Matter movement, we do not want to take away the importance that that 
movement has right now. Mm -hmm. We are allies to all minorities. If one minority is under attack, it means all minorities are mm -hmm. under attack. Islamophobia, as you can see on this tweet, is not new in Tennessee. It's a billion dollar industry. Southern Poverty Law Center has identified 38 hate groups right here in Tennessee, mm -hmm. of which four are dedicated anti-Muslim groups. So we understand that the threat from these hateful groups is constant. It was just that when Tennessean offered the ad space to them, mm -hmm. we felt that we lost an ally. Oh. So that was that was very shocking. And once we got to hear from the reporters on how appalled they were by this ad, we understood that those reporters did not have a direct hand in it. Mm -hmm. However, there's one thing that I would always want to point out is that our faith teaches us kindness and forgiveness, especially in testing times. So even though that we are really not happy and uh, we, we really feel threatened and hurt by the ad that was run, we feel that it's important for journalists to understand that this is a time for them to reflect somberly mm -hmm and go back and see how many positive stories they can do on Muslims mm -hmm. that, that they can run in Tennessee. And because a lot of times we see the media bias against yeah, Muslims and Muslim communities. And that's something. Uh, actually, this is really. So I'm. I'm. A, you know. I'm. A, I'm a journalist. I used to work for a small newspaper as well. And one of the things that small community me newspapers are struggling with is what happens is uh, when you come and report on a story and you make this like binary, like uh, this is what happened, and I'm going to report. For example, if it's a school bullying issue, you talk to the parents and you talk to the school administration, and there's this you pitting two uh, parties. Uh, against each other and that how does that build community like how does how does even uh how we report stories build community or do they destroy community because you know that sort of sells the clickbait the sort of like pitting two voices against each other so that's something that's a change that a lot of i know newspaper smaller newspaper editors struggle with journalists struggle with um because corporate media, that's what sells, right? So, um, and, but th those journalists have to live in the communities that they report on. So it's not easy to just like do that and leave. So um, what I wanted to ask you, your, uh, in your personal journey to um, running for office, like what is hate in, what does hate in Tennessee look like? What does anti-Muslim bigotry look like in Tennessee? What have you experienced? Well, I will tell you that I absolutely love this place. Okay. Um, it is a very warm community, kind-hearted people, a lot of, uh, you know, bless your heart. And it takes a little bit of time to understand that what actually is meant and what is the tone when somebody tells you, bless your heart. Uh, Polite racism is something that I would use the term to describe it because there's no other way to describe it. People are actually really nice to you. And, and it may give you mis, mixed signals, but you have to understand where they're coming from and what moment you're in with them. Um, when you mentioned that these reporters live in the communities that they work in, that they report on, this was exactly the sentiment we had on uh, regarding this current crisis that we're facing after um, this unfortunate ad was uh, run in Tennessee. And these reporters do the hard work of going into small communities, building relationships. And when something like this happens, it betrays their work. Um, it betrays the readership. It betrays the trust that we have in this institution. So they have to restart the exhausting work of then coming back, offering an apology, making sure it's sincere. And the first thing that we did on Twitter as soon as we were made aware of, of this incident was that we asked Tennessean 
to return the ad money and contribute it to AMAC, which is, you know, the American uh, Muslim Advisory Council based here, right here in Middle Tennessee. They do the tireless work of building bridges between communities. They have done a lot of interfaith work right here in Middle Tennessee. And that is something that we will follow up and make sure that that happens. Uh, Were you satisfied with how the uh, incident was handled by the reporter post your the backlash? Uh, what like were you happy with the steps that have currently been taken? Or um, and I want to know if what further actions would you you would like to see? And I I know you you talked about doing more stories on the Muslim community. So let me know. You know, are, what what what's your position right now? So we were told by the Tennessean that failure happened in the ad department. The person who first saw the ad, uh, they flagged it and they brought it to their supervisor. It was the failure on supervisor's part because they agreed to run the ad. They gave it to two other people in the same um, ad and marketing department and both of them did not take time to read the ad in its entirety. So what we're being told by Tennessean is that that supervisor who had okayed the ad has been relieved from their position at the Tennessean. And um, they have also returned the money back to the fringe organization or the fringe religious group, uh, which is based in uh, Arkansas. Um, they have also promised to uh, give the money to AMAC and also give ad space for future uh, ads that are run by AMAC and other Muslim organizations. Uh, however, this is not the only thing we have asked for. This is just the first few steps in the right direction to make amend to this colossal mistake. What we have asked them to do is to make sure that they're not only denying the ad space to anti-Muslim groups, but they're also denying the editorial space mm -hmm. to anti-Muslim voices. Because in the past, we have seen several anti-Muslim voices that had, you know, that they were given an editorial. Mm -hmm. We're also asking them to do a diversity training with AMAC. Okay. We're also asking them to do maybe make sure that they can do an investigative report on the hate groups that are right now working out of Tennessee and uh, find out, you know, follow the money, where the money is coming from, who's paying these. Um, a lot of uh, hate rallies have happened in Tennessee in the past. And as you can uh, see that Islamophobia has been sanctioned by the highest office in our current times, which is the most unfortunate thing for all minorities, not just Muslims, but all minorities. Also hiring people of color in these organizations, hiring more journalists of color, hiring more minorities is going to be something that I hope Tennessee will look into and consider. Oh, excellent. So one thing that I wanted to uh, ask you was, what is July 18th going to look like for the Muslim community in Tennessee? Okay. This is one of the things that a lot of people at AMAC and a lot of leaders in the local uh, mosque have um, shared concerns with. Should we beef up the security? Should we ask for more, you know, more police patrolling? Will the Juma prayer will be will will the Juma prayer be safe to go and attend? As as you know, with the pandemic for for almost three months, mosques have been closed. There were no congregation prayers. No Tarabi, there was no Eid congregation. So now that Sajids are slowly getting back to being open, they, they have a very small capacity that they will allow people to gather in because of pandemic anyways. But the small group of people that will choose to go will have the, 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 the sense of uh, being under threat constantly. This is really the most unfortunate part about Tennessee and reali realizing the grave mistake they made in, in running this ad. That's, and um, so from my, um, you know, discussion with you and with Sabina, 
one of the things that I can see is that the approach that you all have taken and that that could be a case study for others who live in um, communities where the Muslim community is a small, in, very tiny in number compared to some of the larger cities like here in you know the DMV area, we have gigantic mosques filled up all the time because there's just like 10% of Montgomery County is Muslim. So, um, you know, that's a very different, or Chicago or Los Angeles, like that's a very different scenario than where you all are at. And, mm -hmm. and some of the, the positives that people can take away from this is that building up those coalitions and having those ties. Um, so this is something that has been, uh, you know, repeatedly bought up by you as well as um, Sabina. Well, um, I'm, I'm really grateful for you guys to be here and to share your thoughts on this uh, because it's it's important for us to reflect on uh, what went right and what went wrong or what could, you know, what, what, how, what communities, you know, like taking back the narrative yourself and really um, being at that forefront and not taking it lying down because there are a lot of communities that have um, uh, they're, they're scared to even speak up. And um, that's really excellent that you guys, and I know you've been trained through the, um, through the various waves of Islamophobia that's come your way since, you know, for the past couple of years. So um, any last th thoughts? Well, the last thoughts, the parting thoughts are that American Muslims are as American as anyone else. Mm -hmm. High time for American Muslims to realize that we should start telling our own stories in our own way with our own perspectives. Because if we don't tell our stories, somebody else will, and they will tell it with their own narrative or their own perspective, and we won't like it. So, right now in this moment, we need to really just, like you said, stand up for ourselves speak for ourselves, tell our own stories, and go forward from this point onwards. We have been under threat constantly in Tennessee by any, uh, I, I believe there are probably maybe 30,000 Muslims in, in Tennessee, in Middle Tennessee area. And we all are linked in a way that we serve this community with the best that we have to offer. We call it home. We pay our taxes here. We, we are raising our children here. This is the community we call home. And when you love your community and when you love something, you stand up for it. And this is the moment where Muslim community says, you know what, Tennessee, and you did make a mistake. It was a grave mistake. We were hurt by it. But instead of punishing you, we're asking you for self-reflection. We're asking you to learn from this moment. We're asking you to build, build on this moment so that whatever work the reporters have done in our community, we build on it and move forward. We don't walk away, but we move forward and we move forward together. Well, thank you so much for being here and thank you so much to my audience. And this is exactly what we're doing. We're doing, we're creating our own narrative here on Muslim Network TV. Uh, we are broadcast on Galaxy 19 all over Canada, United, United States and Mexico. And so you're watching the Justice for All Now program. Um, thank you all for so much for being here. It's important for us to learn from our local communities what has worked for them and what's happening globally, nationally. I, I welcome you to, to tomorrow's show where we'll be talking about DACA and Supreme, this recent Supreme Court decision. We'll have three D dreamers on, um, on board and we'll have a, an attorney who will be telling us about the next steps that um, what happens after the Supreme Court decision. So thank you so much for joining us. This is Hannah Zaberi, uh, Justice for All Now. Thank you so much.